Welcome to the Optimalist Podcast. I'm Sarah, your host through this adventure about mindfulness, attention, focus, happiness, and motivation. At a time when all of these things seem elusive and desired all at once. So how do we cultivate them? Today, I have Dr. Krista Lay on the show. Krista is the founder of Resonance Educational Consulting, which supports educators in building meaningful, engaging, and sustainable cultures that enhance social-emotional learning and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Her 24-year career in education includes being a high school social studies teacher, instructional tech coach, curriculum coach, and student leadership advocate. Krista was also an adjunct professor for a master's in education program specializing in SEL. She designed and facilitated methods of research, curriculum design and development, and culturally responsive teaching. In 2012, Krista was one of 26 educators in the country selected as an ASCD Emerging Leader. And since then, she's worked with educators in nearly 30 states to feel more confident and competent in integrating SEL into learning communities. It was wonderful to talk to Krista again, especially in the context of this show. Listen in as Krista and I talk about the five competencies of SEL, why it's important to not think of SEL as just a program, and what it looks like when we take steps toward better integration. All this and so, so, so much more in this conversation with Krista. Have a listen. I love not knowing what the all the questions cool. are. I like not knowing too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you think back to where you started way back at the beginning of your career, and you might be somebody who thinks of yourself as having had many lives in the career path or journey as I do, um, what what has influenced your path from then to now? Or what is the biggest thing? You could even think of it as what is the biggest influence that is pushing you? What is pushing you in your work at this moment? Kind of any way you want to take that that question. Yeah, that's a, a fantastic question. I actually would take two approaches based on the way that you just asked it. So I always thought that I was going to be a high school social studies teacher. I figured that I'd retire from that after 45 years. You know, I'd be like 85 years old, pushing myself into the <laughs> classroom. <laughs> Walker. Um, but along the way, there were people who came into my life who saw that I had potential in ways that I didn't realize I did. There was a mentor of mine named Mr. Tom Stecker, who I started doing work for once he came in to work with our Student Leadership Academy. And he said, have you thought about working in the adult realm and teaching classes and working at our leadership conference? And I also had a principal who said, have you ever considered being an instructional tech coach? And I said to both of them, I said, no, I got through my master's degree never having touched technology. I did all the research and gave it to somebody else. Um, I don't think I'm a good fit for that. And he said, you work well with others. You can learn the technology. I really think you should apply for this position. And Tom also said to me when I replied to him, I don't have a degree to do this. He said, you don't need a degree. You just need a willingness to learn and to continue to grow and work hard. I love that. Um, yeah. So I don't. I think it was people seeing something in me and believing in me in times when I didn't think that I that I was able to accomplish those goals or even knew that they were goals that I had. And the reason I continue on this path is because I know that our students show up as them whole as their whole selves in learning and education has really gotten segmented to where we're only focusing on their academics and their achievement and we really need to look at them as whole people and what they're bringing in socially and emotionally and how they're relating to others and working with others and getting to know themselves in order for them to be achieving at their highest potential. So that actually might be a great way to begin talking about, uh, if anyone hasn't guessed already from what you've heard so far, we're talking about SEL today. And a lot of details that have to do with the integration of SEL. And I want to start by, I cut, maybe Krista can recite this herself, but um, the, Krista has a line that I will never forget from our first, um, I still can't believe when we talked that time, Krista, we talked for like two hours 
And I was like, how have we never had a just a one on one conversation before and we could have kept going. I think it was a Friday morning and I was like, wow, I could just um, block out my whole calendar and keep talking. But I will never forget that she started that conversation with uh, a line that talked about SEL not being a program. And it is something that not only stuck with me, I wrote it in my notes from that conversation, but I bring it up all the time now in my conversations with other educators. And I often say, as Krista once said, <laughs> so I would love to just open up um, talking about SEL and the five competencies, which I hope that you can kind of back up a little bit and maybe define for people that because I know that there are a lot of people that know that they're there and they're out there. Maybe they know the names of them, but they're not really doing this work deeply in their school system. So I think a little bit more of a basic introduction might be necessary before diving a little bit more deeper. But we can start by saying, like, maybe you can talk to us about this idea that SEL should not be a program. What is it that we should think of it instead? And what are the five competencies that are so important for us to get to know? Yeah. Um, so there are lots of different frameworks for what social emotional learning is out there. Um, if you Google them, you'll find different descriptions of what it looks like and sounds like. I subscribe to the Castle model. Mm -hmm. It's a collaborative for academic, social and emotional learning. And they define five separate competencies. And the first two are intrapersonal competency. So it has to do with us as a self as an individual. And the first is self-awareness, how we're thinking about ourselves. And that includes our emotions, knowing our strengths, having a sense of purpose, a growth mindset. And then the second part of that is how we are acting based on those thoughts and those beliefs. And that's our self-management. So that is how we're managing our emotions, how we're responding to others. Um, it is also about motivation and, and determination, and it's about setting goals and being able to follow through on them. And then the next two competencies are interpersonal competencies, how we're interacting with other people. And the first is on social awareness, which is how we're thinking about other people. So taking perspective, developing empathy, being able to um, understand social context and how that influences a person's actions or beliefs. Hmm. And then the fourth is uh, relationship skills, and that is then how we're acting based on our thoughts. And so that is, are we communicating effectively? Are we culturally competent? Do we understand the pieces of teamwork and can work collaboratively? Uh, do we stand up for the rights of others and can we resist peer pressure? And then the last competency is on responsible decision making. And it's, are we curious? Are we seeking new information? Are we grappling with that new information? and determining what would be the best course of action when trying to make a decision or trying to solve a problem. And then once we decide that direction that we're going, having some reflection time and identifying if that truly was the best decision for who we are and our values and our beliefs, but also for those of us around us and in our community. So was it responsible? Was it ethical? Uh, was it respectful? And I look at social emotional learning as a set of skills that will help us be good humans. And I put good in quotes, mm -hmm. purposely productive lives, no matter what type of job we have, because we're going to need to know ourselves and be able to interact with others in a way that is respectful and responsible and ethical. I understand this idea of people wanting to make it a program because there might be the intention is that how can we help teachers embed this or integrate this? But I feel that programs can actually backfire on us for a number of reasons. And so I prefer to look at SEL as who we are and what we do every day of our lives, um, how we interact with people, uh, how we get to know ourselves, um, how we live into our values and how we make decisions um, and how we lead our lives. Thank you for breaking down the intra and inter. I'm taking notes as again as you're talking. I have a should have a whole Krista file here of notes that I take <laughs> when we talk, and I refer to them all the time. It's like I'm um, um I'm in education when when I'm talking with you. But all of those elements that you just described that go into both of those pieces seem to me um, just like you're talking about here, like the 
instead of thinking of it as a program, it's it really is building this whole person. I mean, it sounds to me like what you're building as if someone is learning all how to integrate and use and develop all of these different things throughout their childhood and young adult life and well into adulthood, you're you're forming a person who's not only responsible and empathetic and socially aware and self-aware, um, all of those are part of it, but you're forming a person who then can stand up for themselves really I think with control and confidence in society and within one's own life. And I think that it's really hard to feel like I could feel like, as you're describing that, all of those aspects, I could feel like the development of a confident, full human being. Um, and I think that that is something that we don't talk about really as far as when we really do break it off and say, well, you know, we've been going through X, Y, Z in our community or um, COVID has happened and now we have this mental health crisis. So we need to integrate SEL as a program or we need to we need to do more of this. Um, and I think it, it how how do you move forward and build this whole confident person when it's just added as an extra um, whenever we do feel like we have to, quote unquote, do more of this? So that's that's what I'm thinking of too. What you're describing to me is what we all need. And and it's hard to think of it as something that is often just decided as an an added on bonus kind of thing. I think that we segment and section and compartmentalize so many things in education and I would hate to see this become something else that's compartmentalized. Like mm-hmm. I understand morning meetings and I think they're a fabulous way to start the day. But then how do we maintain those themes and a focus on those skills throughout the entire day so that it's not just during that time period? Or maybe you have an advocacy period in the middle school or at the high school, but what's happening outside of those 40 minutes or the hour and a half? Exactly. Um, It's this lifelong learning. And so I'm still growing in these skills and competencies and I would say that it really wasn't until I was in my early 30s that I really started focusing on it for myself and growing and and thinking about how it applies to me. So um, I look at social emotional learning as a lens through which I view the world. And even if I'm not in a school working with students or staff, I'm constantly reflecting on my own thoughts and my own actions and how I'm, you know, interacting with my own kids to right. see if being a good model. And if I'm not, which we're human and we're going to make mistakes, how do I come back from that? And so I think it's a model for human growth and development, not something to be sectioned off at a certain time where only certain people have the right or the the capacity to be able to have these conversations or do this work with students. And also what you're describing uh, as part of your own reflective practice, if if one does make that into such a built in part of of their life, I feel like it's so it's so hard for it to not snowball as you get deeper into adulthood that it's so hard for it to not snowball into something really, really beautiful that you cannot live without because you can feel yourself growing and changing consistently, not just in in model uh, for people around you or for students, but also to to build a better life for you as an individual. And I think it's it can become that part becomes addicting, I think. And I think most people don't get there where they do it long enough and see the result. Um, and I think I, and thinking about what that the impact that would have on on younger people, because we're thinking about it as adults, uh, but thinking about the impact that that would have on younger people is very exciting. And I'm wondering what what of everything that you're talking about so far, where do we typically see these practices emerge most in a school? And maybe with that, what what parts of the competencies are often embraced the most? Because I think I, I have an idea of what you see people most often finding easiest to build in and and which ones yeah. are kind of ignored the most. Another fantastic question. Um, And so uh, a colleague and I, Dr. Linda Megger, um, we created an SEL implementation audit. And so we really wanted to know about what people, what what organizations were putting in to 
the system, the culture to get the outputs. Because oftentimes we'll say, well, how do we grow students in these competencies? And so part of that was looking at research that had been published by CASEL um, in 2017, 19, 21. And what we found in their program analysis is that there really wasn't any one program that addressed all five competencies equitably. So even some of our more famous and really well-researched programs like Second Step and PBIS and Leader and Me um, really put an emphasis on uh, self-management, on relationship skills, on, on responsible decision-making. And in our research and in our own data collection, what we found is that more elementary schools focused on all five more equitably. But by the time we got to middle school and high school, there was a big drop off in, in a focus on self-awareness and social awareness with the assumption that students would naturally grow on this on their own. So I don't necessarily say that programs are not a good thing because if they're working for your organization and you know you're getting the intended outcomes that you want, keep doing that. But look to see if it really is addressing all five competencies. Um, I think that just some more explicit, intentional focus on the self-awareness and social awareness would really help our students um, be able to, once we're, ch we're thinking about their mindsets and who they are and how to connect with other people, we'll actually see that happen in practice more often. And what, what does it look like if, if you can, I'm, I'm, uh, I can't stress enough to the listeners out there that Krista has no idea what I'm asking her as I'm asking her. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, <laughs> as I frame what sounds like a really thoughtfully, <laughs> thoughtful, intriguing <laughs> question to her, I'm like, so what does it look like when blah, 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 blah? I actually have no idea if she knows the answer, <laughs> but I'm trusting that she does because she's amazing. So I'm just going to trust, I'm going to trust that you can <laughs> paint this picture for me uh, or for all of us when I say what would it look like or does it look like for SEL to, if you picture even just one school building, um, what would it look like for SEL to not be only a program or only something that is isolated in, in and used it for specific people or in times of need? What would that look like? That is another really good question. And I've been doing a lot of thinking around this. And the model that we use when we're working with organizations is built upon this framework. So we say that there are four entry points to integrating social emotional learning. Um, when you walk into a building, when you walk into a classroom, I should say when I walk in, I can't help but take in everything I'm seeing and everything I'm hearing. And I get a sense for the building? Like, do I feel comfortable here? Do I feel welcome? Do people seem upbeat and happy? Like, what is the messaging that's up on the walls? Uh, the quotes, the pictures, the trophies, who and what is valued? How are um, tables and couches and chairs organized and set up? Is there opportunity for reflection and for collaboration? Um, so I think the physical environment is one piece of that. And part of that physical environment kind of lends itself then into social interactions. How are people treating one another? I are they that. feeding each other? Do they say hi? Do they help each other in the hallway? Are they using kind, respectful words? Mm -hmm. um, and this is what teachers think of when they think of SEL. Well, I have a relationship. Right. And that's part of it. But it's more that it's once we have that relationship, how are we being explicit about giving them opportunities to grow in those skills because they deepen in complexity as you go from kindergarten through 12th grade. So then our third entry point is looking at instructional practices. So this is, this is going to take a little bit more time and a little bit more thought because a lot of our teachers are doing this already, but they're not being explicit with the students about it. Um, so I'm going to divert here just a little bit and tell a story that my older son, who's in college now, when he was in eighth grade, he came home and said, my math teacher doesn't teach. Hmm. I'm like, really? Okay, tell me more. And he's like, all she does is put us into groups and gives us problems to work on. And she, she just walks around. She doesn't do anything. I said, but Ethan, I know you and your friends. You all think you're right. She's giving you an opportunity <laughs> to negotiate, to communicate with each other, to collaborate. And I bet if you got stuck, 
she would come over and help you either with the social emotional skills or with math. And he said, well, yeah. I said, so she's teaching you both things, content and giving you an opportunity to practice skills. But she didn't say that to him explicitly. So yeah, it just went over his head. And I don't even know, maybe she didn't realize what she was doing, but it was a prime opportunity to say, hey, while you're working on these math problems, I really want you to focus on listening to each other and adding on to one another's work instead of just talking over each other and saying you're right and they're wrong. You know, I love that you're telling this story. And I was giggling a little at the beginning because some of the words that your son is saying to you, I have memories of students coming into my room and saying them to me about other teachers like, oh, I just came from so-and-so and and she just doesn't teach. And I would say, well, what do you mean by that? And they would describe such a similar scene to what you just told me your son experienced, or it would be independent work with like, and I know exactly what the teacher is doing just from the kid telling me what they're doing for 30 seconds. And um, it's such a common response to at least when I was in the classroom, it's such a common response to a teacher not being directly involved in giving instruction is the student does not understand that what they're being given is so much more. And I, yes. I mean, so, so much, I mean, and that's all, especially teenagers constantly comparing one class to another, one teacher to another, like my, why is my 11th grade English teacher not do this? And yours does. And it's like, and then they describe it to me. I'm like, they're actually doing it better than I am right now. So don't compare it to me. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm putting notes on and giving you a PowerPoint. And this this person next door is doing a way better job. Uh, so that's interesting that that is that's an interpretation that I think is is universal. And you're right. It could also be that the way we set up that kind of a lesson is is the teacher. Being, and do you need to be explicit? At what point should do you not need to be explicit about what it is that you're attempting to teach them um, with those small groups or independent um, learning? Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, and, and I would I would actually argue that the student should always know, mm-hmm. like we're not doing anything. That's what I would that. say too. Yep. But we also, if we keep it a quote secret, then they're not learning to be reflective of their own growth and their own yeah. practice. Um. So. I think some of the ways that we would say like, okay, here's our content piece, but here's an SEL skill I want you to focus on. And here's how we're going to self-assess. So we've also been working at Residence Ed, we've also been working on this too, that it shouldn't just be the teacher doing an observation or collecting data from the students. The students should be doing a self-assessment yeah. on, okay, you know what? I really struggled with that SEL skill you know, during this content piece. Um, this is where I went wrong and this is what I want to try to do next time. And it should be more of a collaborative conversation um, and the students taking ownership for that growth and for that learning as well. And uh, so then the, our last approach would be linking it into content, like the curricular content. So thinking about ELA or social studies and different time periods in history and what were, what must they be thinking and Taking different perspectives, like from social studies, the what was the social, the emo- or the economic, the political perspective? What was this country's perspective versus this one? Mm. Or, you know, what if you were this character in the book? What might have been going through your mind? What are their strengths? Um, in math, we really would focus in on uh, perseverance and determination, and how do you manage when you're trying to solve a problem and it's just not working out for you? Um, in science, it could be the scientific process with responsible decision making. Um, in tech ed, it's, you know, they're collaborating, they're bouncing ideas, they're giving feedback to each other on their projects. And are we giving really solid feedback? Or are they just saying, oh, that looks good? Or, yeah, it's okay. Like, how can we help build their skill sets so that they're working as a connected community? Oh my gosh, there's so many questions bubbling up as you're talking. I can't like looking at what time it is. I'm like, okay, calm down. <laughs> um, but so now you we've now you've described physical. We have physical environment. The idea of thinking, or just to back up for one second, we are describing what it would look like for SEL to not be just a program or something separate in a school. What would the what would a building look like? And so we've gone through the physical environment how people are treating one another 
instructional practices and now curricular content, which I love that perspective, like thinking about perspectives and what it is that we should be getting from the content that is in front of us. And I'm wondering if within that, I was waiting to see if this was part of it, but I don't, I don't know that we've touched on it yet, but woven through all of those, where do we see the individual solo growth? Is it, is it part, is it kind of combining elements from each or is there an individual reflective or self-regulatory practice that is built within this type of model? In my perfect world, the teachers would own it and the students would own it as well. Mm -hmm. So they know like this is the skill that we're working on today, this week, this month. And here is my own growth. Here's my own um here's how I'm keeping track of my growth. Like okay. I really proud that I did this and give a specific example. Or you know what I slipped here and here's what I should have done because this was the outcome. And this is what I meant when I when I mentally go through this process myself at different times of the day. I would love for students to have that become an ongoing, regular part of their work, of their daily practice. And teachers, we can model this for them by saying like, okay, maybe it's what is your SEL goal this week? And on a Monday, they write it out and they start working on goal setting, which uh -huh. is self met, And then they revisit it on Friday. And then set a new goal for that next Monday, or maybe they need to add in some scaffolds to help them continue to achieve the goal. I, I just feel very strongly that our students and our families and community need to be a part of co-creating this. Yes. It can't agree. be teachers giving a grade or telling students where they're doing well and where they're struggling. Okay, so then that's related to actually my next two maybe smaller questions, but um, one of them is... Are there are there parts of this that you also have built in or that you've witnessed that extend beyond the school building that are naturally, I don't want to say easy, but are, uh, you know, relatively adaptable to home life, to the weekend, to bringing into the summer? Like, how do you how do you see that these things, just like how we worry kids are leaving curriculum and all of that, everything behind whenever they're not in school, but I do feel like SEL has this magical power to tap in somewhere that we can help realize that, help everybody realize that the things that we're doing in school are not for school, they're for life and they're for us as humans. So like, is there an element of that that, that helps us branch into all of life? Definitely. So I am the, the mom of three boys. My older is 21. My middle is 18 and going off to college next year. And I have a bonus son, my stepson, who is 17. And just, I guess, my first example, I would say, is that in everyday life, in our conversations, if I, if we're talking about something and we have different perspectives and maybe they say something that hits on a core value of mine and I like, but I, mm -hmm. and I might interrupt them, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe say that that happens occasionally. Um, what do I do about that then? Because I just shut down a conversation and that's not the role model I want to be. So it's me coming back around to them saying, you know what? I realize what I did and I apologize. Could we have a redo on this? And I'd like to hear your thoughts without me interrupting you. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's how we respond to students and to our own kids that we're responding and not reacting. And I think that's really important. Um, on how we're modeling our own growth, even our mistakes with our with our kids. Um, I'm also very sensitive to different times of the day. I read somewhere at home, the most important times of the day for your kids are the first thing when they wake up, first thing they come home from school and before they go to bed. And so I'm really aware, hyper aware, really, of checking in on my kids at those different points and making sure like, I still go wake up my teenagers in the morning. I know they have their phones to wake them up, but I like to go in and wake them up. It's not the same. Yeah, that the human interaction is, yeah, I think I think that's a good plan. You know, or to check in and like have a good day. And, that, you know, I know you have something big coming up and good luck with that. Or mm -hmm. when they come home, how was your test? How did track go? At night, you know, always say good night. And like, I don't want to skip over those, what could be seen as little things like those are important times for me 
Especially since, and and I, I do love that you're mentioning the times of day, because I think that no matter what your personality, and we all like to attach ourselves to, um, to I'm a night person, I'm a morning person. And, and to some extent, that's true. But I think that we all recognize some of those same patterns of the day. And I think it's a universal thing to want to I mean, they're, they're places to take breaks. They really, the, the, the times that you're mentioning are times that we either are, we need to think about a transition in between two parts of the day, or we're, they're the times where we're quieting down and getting ready, or we're quieting down because it's time to shut down for the day. And I think recognizing all of those natural breaks in our day is a really mindful way to look at um, even being part of a family, which is what I was going to say is like it, it, in any given household, right? We have, we're all in our bubbles of our own personal technology and world now. It's like there could be five people, a mix of adults and kids in one house, and they're all in their own little like floating world of whatever it is that they personally are doing. Um, and it's way, way, way more developed and intricate because we also have a personal or many personal devices that are all different. And so how do we separate from those and bring ourselves together in awareness that we all also have a life with each other? And I think what you're describing does that. And I would add, because I think you bring up a really good point about the technology and that my music connects us. So my kids will send me songs they're listening to, or when we go in a car, in the car, I let them put on the radio and they play their songs and they'll say to me like, uh, you know, this one has this theme and, but this is why I like the song, you know, even though it talks about depression or it might talk about this or that, here's why I like it. What do you think about it? My one son is a gamer, a computer gamer. And so he'll show me things and it doesn't make sense to me at first. I'm like, ah. but you know what? <laughs> we'll eat dinner together and we'll put the TV on and he'll explain to me the game that I'm watching. And I started to get into it. And I'm like, this is of course. really deep and complicated. And I right. understand now why you like this. Like, I want them to share their strengths and their joys. And I want them to know that I have time to get to know them. Um, my bonus son will come in and I'm like, do you want to put something on the TV? Like, I'll always turn off my show to put and we'll watch something together. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that's important to let them not go off and do the technology on their own, but like, I want to be a part of that. Yeah. It's so easy to dismiss like a, a kid or a teenager's decision to watch or attach themselves to something or play a certain thing. Like, oh, oh you know, you might like pass a couple of teenagers playing video games and be like, oh, they're, that's just what they do. But like, if you ask why they're doing it or why, you know, they have a thousand million choices of what they could be playing. But when you engage them in what their choice is, um, I think you're never not surprised as to what it reveals about who they are. And that's the cyclical nature of social emotional learning. So when they're sharing things about who they are and what they enjoy and their strengths, I am practicing social awareness because I'm learning about their perspective yes. and I'm learning how to build a better relationship with them while they're sharing who they are. So and, and teachers have that opportunity in the classroom as well. And so how would you then, if you do have any kind of tips for adults, how would you guide adults, whether they are teachers and parents, whether they are teachers alone and or or, par or parents of teenagers, however you want to see it, adults that have some contact with children in any way, like how would you support them or encourage them to work on their own social emotional learning, not just so that they can be an influence, but so that they can be someone who understands why we do it, why it's important, why it exists, and why people like yourself are have built a you know, a whole life and career around making sure people understand why it's important. What can we help adults do? I, I think one of the first things is to realize that this is a human skill set. And so mm -hmm. We all can do this. We don't have to be an expert in it. We just have to be willing to be on the journey. And it is a journey. Yes. Um, you're never going to be fully confident in all of those skills at any one time. But your willingness to engage in that journey. And, and I think that even more importantly is we need to find what is an authentic fit for us and our personality and have it align with what our students need 
and the context in which we're teaching. So what SEL looks like in an art class or in a business ed class is going to look different than my social studies class, and that's okay. Uh But I think we should pick what we can do and make explicit and invite students to be part of that process. So, and knowing that when we work together as a collaborative, connected community of educators and adults, we're providing that network of support for our students. Um, so start, start small. Like a, a friend of mine, Dr. P. Grandy said, you know, think big, but start small. Think about where you can integrate explicitly a skill or two and continue to build on that. I love it. So I am going to transition into this next part of our um of our discussion if i if unless you have something that i you feel i've left out or you wanted to go back and touch on i uh think that we've gotten a really good i think basic education here on what it is that the work that you're doing is attempting to help people build these i i love i think you put it as cultures like sustainable cultures that enhance SEL and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I think you've given us a good basic knowledge of that for people who are looking for an entry point into thinking about this more deeply. But if there's anything that you would like to go back uh, and touch on. No, just that um, there are a bunch of resources that might be able to help you take those first steps off mm-hmm. of our website. So um, feel free to go to resonanceed.com. Um, and download any of those resources and think about what those next steps could be. And I'm happy to be a thought partner with anybody who is on the journey. Definitely. Yeah. And we'll share at the end before we before we finish, we'll share anything else and any ways that people can get in touch with you. And before we do that, though, I did want to ask some of our uh, questions that are becoming a nice little fun routine at the end of our conversation, which I think I like to do because I love looking for patterns in the way people think and what they consume, because I think think that they give us insight into whatever the conversation is we just had, because it's different for everybody that's coming on here. And the next one I have will have nothing to do with SEL. But um, the the things that people let in and out of their brains, I think on a regular basis, it's really fun to see how it either reflects or mirrors what it is that they are always thinking about or working on or is completely different. And I like to see if we can find a little connective tissue. So with that being said, Krista, <laughs> can you can you tell us something you're reading right now, watching or listening to, whether it be music or a podcast, um, anything that that you're consuming right now in the world? Yeah. So since I finished my doctorate last year, I am rediscovering my love of reading and audiobooks. So I switch back and forth between books that are fiction, but also lar- like what I would say are learning books. So the last books I've read are Lessons in Chemistry and The Measure were my fiction books. But two of my favorite books that I have read that helped with education, um, one was called Never Split the Difference by Chris Boss. He talks about empathy. He was an FBI hostage negotiator and how to be able to really understand somebody's perspective and where they're coming from and what they need. And I also revisited um, for the Four Frames book by Bowman and Deal, which looked at how to analyze organizations. And um, so cool. my, my reading, I kind of ping back and forth. Um, <laughs> in terms of my listening, I am really into White Buffalo, um, John Moreland, Jacob Banks. They have deep deep voices, kind of like Chris Stapleton. Um, but oh, nice. my older son has also reconnected me to Shine Down and Muse. And they have a lot, their newest records are really about society and humanity. Um, so we've been sharing music like that lately. I love that. And that it was, that was um, you, when you brought up sharing with your kids earlier, that made me think of, I was wondering if you were going to bring something like that up at the end here in that section. And that's really cool. See, we're already connecting. You've already mentioned loving perspectives and um and, and listening and listening to things together with your family. So already connecting everything you've talked about. And what about watching? Yeah. So the funny thing about that is that I go in the opposite direction with what I watch and what's psychological. I love it. Anything that has a twist at the end or shows mm-hmm. So I just finished the Peaky Blinder series. I loved Sons of Anarchy. Cool. 
Breaking Bad, any <laughs> deep character development where I'm like, people live these lives? Like, what? <laughs> yeah, it's an opportunity to get lost in that, right? Like, who are these people? I totally get that. So anything that has a big twist at the end, I'm like, <gasps> all about that, yeah. which is kind of an anti-SEL <laughs> lens. <laughs> You're allowed one thing that's, <laughs> yeah. but that also connects to because you totally see, especially, um, I mean, I get this. I'm someone who becomes completely when I'm dedicated to, um, it could even be a single project as piece, a piece of what I'm working on, but I become so ingrained and dedicated to the cause and the thing that often, uh, you know, every other piece of media in my life isn't somehow related to it. As I look at, a stack of books next to me called Stolen Focus, Attention Span, Find Focus, <laughs> The Open Focus Brain, like everything becomes one thing. And then something has to creep its way in, right? That pulls you out of it. Something has to totally be the opposite. So I completely get that. No, this, that makes me feel better. Because when I explain to people, <laughs> if they're like, but you do, I'm like, I know. <laughs> We have the, uh, our episode that comes out tomorrow, um, and when everybody hears this, this will already be out, but tomorrow, we're, the episode that we're releasing, she, Jillian is our guest, and she talks about, you would never, ever think this from those of you who know Jillian, uh, and she she talks really to, to, to an extent, like at length, about her love for reality TV, like lists off like 10 shows that she she and her husband watch together. And I'm sitting there with my mouth open like, Jillian, I had no idea. <laughs> but it totally makes sense. Like when you think of people, a lot of the people that I'm inviting on this show right now are people who are seriously immersed in their work. And so when you come out of it, you're like, Ooh, what do I want to watch now? And and I think it either comes out in those two forms, either immersing yourself deeply in like lives that you would never know, like you're describing, or like people, like how how do these people exist? Like, or how do we write these people? Or you go the opposite and you're looking at what are essentially are quote unquote real people living the same thing, right? And you're like looking at it from a social perspective, like how do they live these lives? Yes, because <laughs> you just want to be pulled out of your own experience, or you have to. Now to go to just to end on a, a totally opposite <laughs> note, but I'm going to end by asking you a question about attention. So, what is a method for focusing or improving attention that you find actually works? Oh, you know, in our conversations, that this is still something I work on. But there are two things that I, lately that have been helping me. Um, one is that. I don't hop from project to project. As soon as I start to find myself like going to something else, I'll come back and I'm like, just finish this and close it. Because then I end up with a whole bunch of things like open and I get frustrated because I feel like I'd ever finished anything when in fact I finished a, like that makes sense, a whole lot of little things, but reminding myself to finish what I started and honestly taking true breaks where I used to work and then eat lunch while I was working and then eat dinner while I was working. And I'm like, I just will go away from the computer for a while and sit and actually eat my food and listen to music or go take a walk or, you know, do some tours around the house and then come back and work. And I feel that that actual break gives me more energy and helps me refocus again when I need to do that deep thinking. Yeah. And we call them mindful breaks as well, right? Like we can, just like you described, we can get the stuff kind of done when we when we do pieces of it or we do two things at once, but we're, we know we're never really doing two things at once. We're either doing one of them more than the other, or, you know, we're not really, we're not really ever focusing the way that we can. And it is amazing the feeling that you get of like, I mean, for me, of calm when you even have one day where you've only done truly one thing at a time, whether it be the thing you're working on or then taking a break. If you focus on the one thing um, and put all your attention into the present, it's like a complete mind shift like and, and body shift. And I think that that mindfulness each day is something that um, we all deserve to to learn how to do better. Yes, you couldn't have said and it better. <laughs> Perfect. We're a mirror for each other. <laughs> 
Um, well, you heard it here, folks. Uh, Krista and I are good at perfect endings for conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great to talk to you, Krista, and I cannot wait to do it again because I'm sure that we could pick any one of these things that I have listed on this on my note taking document and just go off for another hour on them. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Sarah. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to episode three. And thank you, Krista, for your generosity in lending us such a high level of expertise and passion when it comes to helping us understand the real meaning of social emotional learning. You can find Krista on Twitter and Instagram at resonance underscore ed, and you can visit her at resonanced.com to learn about everything she's working on at Residence Education Consulting. So what did you all think? Your feedback is always needed, always welcome, and there are a million ways to do it. You can leave a comment on Substack, a review in Apple Podcasts, and you can reach me on Twitter at scandela9. You can listen and subscribe to The Optimalist Podcast wherever you love listening to great podcasts. New episodes are released every Wednesday, and links to all of these resources are available in the show notes. The Optimalist Podcast is brought to you by Focusable, the only app that gives you the pulse you need for better attention. And it's free. Create an account today at getfocusable.com or by downloading Focusable on any iOS or Android device. You can also follow us at Get Focusable on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening to The Optimalist. I'll see you next week. Stay focused.